Let's take our Bibles this morning and turn with me to the book of Acts and chapter 13. Acts chapter 13. Uh, we uh, find ourselves here in the midst of, I guess you could say, much action in the church, uh, particularly the church that is at Antioch in Syria who sent out Paul and Barnabas. We know that there are others who accompanied them. And uh, thus far as we've looked at this journey from Antioch, they uh, sailed from Seleucia, which is the coast of Syria, the Mediterranean coast, and they sailed westward to the island of Cyprus. They arrived in Salamis, and then they crossed the island, and they went to Paph uh, Paphos. And then from Paphos, they sailed over to Asia Minor northward. They again sailed on the Mediterranean and arrived in uh, Perga. And uh, from there, they went to Antioch. And so in Acts chapter 13, we uh, saw here that they preached the word uh, in Antioch of Pisidia. And so this is uh, from Asia Minor. You would, they would move northward. And remember, this would be a, quite a bit of hike to go up to Antioch of Pisidia. Uh, we know that they uh, go there and Paul preaches uh, a wonderful message again about the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, that's what the church is supposed to be doing, uh, preaching about Jesus Christ. Uh, the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. And we know that when they preached there, we have read through Acts chapter 13, uh, the Jews go out of the synagogue, so they went on the synagogue. As the Jews go out, the Gentiles then uh, came to Paul and asked if the word could be preached to them on the next Sabbath. And um, the word besought in verse 42 means it's basically they, they begged him, they implored uh, Paul that the word could be preached to them on the next Sabbath. So we read up to this and then we're going to continue and pick it up in verse 44. Notice with me now is the next Sabbath. So this is a week, a week span. The preaching of Jesus Christ was great. The people wanted more. The next week they come and notice verse 44, what is happening here. And the next Sabbath day, verse 44, came almost the whole city together to hear the Word of God. Can you imagine if that would happen today? Wouldn't that be wonderful? That almost the whole city would come together to hear the Word of God. Verse 45, But when the Jews saw the multitudes, they were filled with envy, and spake against those things which were spoken by Paul, contradicting and blaspheming. Then Paul and Barnabas waxed bold and said, It was necessary that the word of God should first have been spoken to you. But seeing ye put it from you, and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, lo, we turn to the Gentiles. For so hath the Lord commanded us, saying, I have set thee to be a light of the Gentiles, that thou shouldest be for salvation unto the ends of the earth, and when the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and glorified the word of the Lord. As many and as many as were ordained to eternal life believed. And the word of the Lord was published throughout all the region. But the Jews stirred up the devout and honorable women and the chief men of the city and raised persecution against Paul and Barnabas and expelled them out of their coasts. And they shook off the dust of their feet against them and came unto Iconium. And the disciples were filled with, what's the next word? Did, did you just read what happened? They were expelled out of the city and they're filled with joy and that's connected with the Holy Ghost. I bring your attention, notice in verse 50, at the end of verse 50, it says that Paul and Barnabas were expelled them out of their coast. That means the border, the border, I guess, of the city, outside the city limits. We don't want any of you. And yet when we read the end, the Bible says that they were filled with joy. I, I would like to preach a message that I've entitled, Expelled or rejected, whatever words you want to use there for what happened, yet filled with joy. 
expelled, yet filled with joy. In this study, I'm going to do this in really, I think, two parts, one this morning, one next week. But I want to focus this morning in the study on try to examine the, the different responses to the Word of God. Uh, it seems to me that what is going on here is there is a city-wide buzz in Antioch of Pisidia because the Word of God is being preached, and yet there are two very different responses. It, it seems to us as we look at the text that there is really no neutral ground. Uh, almost the whole city comes together and there are some people who respond in a particular way to the Word of God and there are others who respond in a different way and those are completely opposed. In verse 44 we see that, uh, notice, almost the whole city uh, came together to hear, notice, to hear what? The Word of God. The Word of God. So it seems to me as we look at our text here that if there's going to be any moving of God that the Word of God needs to be preached. The Word of God needs to be taught and at some measure the people that are listening, uh, something happens to those who want to hear more and there's some that reject. But the point is there seems that the Word of God brings people to a point of decision. And by the way, that's what the Word of God ought to do in our lives. The, the Word of God ought to bring us to a point where we make a decision. Uh, and if we think often that we might be neutral, then we probably are rejectors. Now I want to examine the response to the Word of God and I want to spend some time talking and dealing with the two responses that we find in our text. The first one is some received the Word of God. The second response is, is that some rejected the Word of God. So I want to compare those two, and I want to find here, what does it look like when people receive the Word of God? And what does it look like when people reject the Word of God? And it's interesting to me that those patterns are probably still true today, when people either receive the Word of God or they reject the Word of God. I'm concerned with the elements. If we are going to say that ourselves, that we are receivers of the Word of God, are the things that we find in their reception the same that we find today as we think of ourselves as receptive to the Word of God? And on the other hand, those who are rejecting the Word of God are the elements that are found in those who reject the Word of God still true today, and I think that they are. And so I want to spend some time first to examine those who received the Word of God. As we begin here reading in our text, before we read verse 44, we know that this would be a week later from the time that Paul first preached in the synagogue. Uh, it's quite remarkable that, that Paul had the opportunity. Remember, it was those who asked Paul and Barnabas to, to give an exhortation. And so uh, Paul jumps at the opportunity. By the way, he's got only one opportunity up to this point. Would you exhort us? And that one opportunity is going to really blow up in the city and people are going to want to hear more. But I want to notice some elements here of those who receive the Word of God. The first thing we notice, notice with me verse 42. The Bible says, And when the Jews were gone out of the synagogue, the Gentiles besought that these words might be preached unto them the next Sabbath. Now it's interesting here. He said, These words, whatever Paul had said, they said this. We want to hear it again. In other words, they didn't say, Paul and Barnabas, hey, Paul and Barnabas, do you have something different? Maybe a little peppy for us next week or something a little more substantive or... No, no, he says, could you speak the same words to us next week? Uh, by the way, the words are recorded for us right here in our text. Now, we spent some time looking at that uh, last week, but I'm interested here to see that those who receive the Word of God here, we find basically a spiritual hunger for more preaching. That's what we find. Would you say that as we read verse 42, that the Jews, as they're going out of the synagogue, uh, the Gentiles who often stood on the outskirts or outside of the main area where people were seated listening to the teaching and the preaching of God's Word, the Gentiles were listening in, and as all the Jews were kind of going out, you had kind of the, it'd be like today if we all gathered together together, 
and then there was to be a bunch of people right outside the building and when we were dismissed the people were listening outside in the windows the windows were open and people were listening in. they're not permitted to go in they're listening on the outside and as all of you file out the people are waiting outside and then Paul he ends up going out and the people are still waiting outside and say hey could could you say the same thing next week could you repeat what you just said? We, we want to hear more. And so there seems here that those who receive the Word of God, if we consider ourselves to be those who receive the Word of God, who want to take in the Word of God, there's going to be an evidence, a spiritual hunger for more preaching. Is that you? Man, I can't wait to get to church so I can hear more preaching and teaching. Is that us? Uh, by the way, I, I think that as we look at our text, this, we see that among the Gentiles, that's evident, but we also see that actually among the Jews. If you note with me, um, we know verse 42, the Gentiles come to Paul and they ask for the same word to be preached unto them, but notice verse 43. Now, when the congregation was broken up, many of the Jews and religious proselytes followed Paul and Barnabas. So if you notice the scene, all the Jews are out. Now the Jews at that time, they didn't know. They're kind of looking around. They didn't want to publicly endorse Paul and Barnabas. And so they all file out of the building. Uh, Paul and Barnabas go out and the Gentiles speak to them. But uh, outside of the group of the Gentiles, there's some Jews kind of looking on, finding out where Paul's going. And they don't want to be seen by the other Jews. And so they're going to come to Paul and Barnabas kind of secretly, kind of like Nicodemus did with Jesus Christ. And they're going to come to him. Uh, notice uh, the religious Jews and proselytes, they follow Paul and Barnabas. So that means that <laughs> it's, it would, it would, you know, it's, it's kind of strange, right, if somebody's following you around. But evidently, I think they were waiting for an opportunity to speak where they could not be seen by the other Jews who had attended the services. And so they're following at a distance, and they're probably think at some point they got to the place where they thought, okay, now's a good time. No, no, nobody's looking. And so they went to Paul and Barnabas, and notice, who, speaking to them, so I believe Paul and Barnabas spake to them, the Jews, persuaded them to continue in the grace of God. So, so here what Paul is saying in Barnabas is, apparently there are some people who were Jews in the synagogue who had received the word of God. It was secretive. Because they had not acknowledged it publicly in front of the other Jews in the synagogue. But when Paul speaks to them, it is evident, it is kind of understood that they had received what Paul had said because he, he persuaded them to continue in the grace of God. In other words, to not be ashamed of the word of God. You, you've acknowledged the things that you've heard. Continue in the grace of God. And so you see here, uh, the point is there's... Uh, we find a spiritual hunger for more preaching, both among the Gentiles and also among the Jews. Just the fact that they're just following Paul and Barnabas. It's, they want more. We find a spiritual hunger for more preaching. But second thing, the second thing we find in verse 44, notice verse 44 says, And the next Sabbath day came almost the whole city together to hear the word of God. What, what happened? Here's what we find. We find an enthusiasm for others to hear the same. They came to Paul and Barnabas and said, we want to hear the same words. And you know what they did? When they went back home, they told everybody. <laughs> there was an enthusiasm in them. They thought to themselves, hey, I want my neighbor to hear I want my family to hear. I want the people uh, that I have contact with to hear. And by the space of one week, the Bible says almost the whole city came together, which tells us that there was an enthusiasm on their part for others to hear the same thing. Is there an enthusiasm in us for others whom we know to hear the same thing that we hear on a weekly basis? You see, that is a characteristic here. This is an evidence of those who are receptive of the Word of God. Uh, they, they'd be, they said, hey, look, you need to come and listen. So well, what does he talk about? Look, I, we, we had one opportunity to hear it. You just need to come next week. We asked them to say the same words. And so if, it's pretty amazing. And by the way, what, what did he preach on? Jesus Christ. That's pretty amazing. Amen. What he did for us. Amen. Jesus Christ came into this world without ceasing to be God. Great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. And Jesus Christ walked this earth for 33 and a half years. He lived a perfect, sinless life. 
He presented Himself before the world as the Lamb that was slain before the foundation of the world. And when He died on the cross, it was done by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God. And He was offered as a sacrifice for the sins of men because men are guilty before a holy God. They have violated the law of God and the, we are all destined to hell. And yet God in His love, He sent His Son Christ to die for our sins. He became sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him, that is Christ. That's the good news. You see, uh, the Jews are used to the, the, the idea of now they're in the synagogues and they're at the temple, but they know the concept of sacrifice. They certainly take pilgrim, pilgrimages over to the temple. They know what it is to sacrifice. And so here, he's been talking about Jesus Christ, the seed of David, the seed of Abraham, and this Holy One, it is by His name that we can be saved. And have our sins forgiven. And so the people said, you just need to come next week and hear. You need to hear. You see, those who receive the word have an enthusiasm for others to hear the same. Let me ask, ask this. I, I know you come to church, you're obviously here this morning. But do you have an enthusiasm for others to hear? Or maybe you feel like, well, I just, you know, I don't want people to... I invite people because they might think that, you know, it's kind of strange. Well, I wonder what they're going to think about church. I wonder what they're going to think about the teaching and the preaching of God's Word. They might think it's something strange. That's not at all the attitude of those who receive the Word of God. You see, the Spirit of God is working in the lives of people. And here these people had not only a spiritual hunger for more preaching, but an enthusiasm for others to hear the same. We also go down with me to verse 48. We read about the Gentiles, and when the Gentiles heard this, they were glad. Now, Paul uh, says that we, because the Jews as a whole, we know some Jews believe, but the Jews as a whole in the synagogue rejected. They uh, created a crowd against Paul and Barnabas. And um, we see that... Um, he says, we're going to turn to the Gentiles. And when the Gentiles heard this in verse 48, they were glad and glorified the word of the Lord, as many as were ordained to eternal life. Do you notice the word? They glorified the what? Did they glorify Paul and Barnabas? No. Uh, you remember early on they said, hey, could you repeat the same words? Not, hey, can, can you uh, give us like the same show? Uh, would you entertain us the same way next week as you entertained us? No, no. We want to hear more of the Word of God. And when they come back the next week, almost the whole city is there. He preaches the Word of God. And when people hear it again, people say, wow, the Word of God is amazing. Uh, the Word of God is life-changing. And the Bible says they were glad and they glorified or they exalted the Word of the Lord. Is that what we do? Do we leave church with an excitement? Say, man, the Word of God was just amazing. It was what I needed today. You, you know, you know I, that, that's an encouragement as a pastor when somebody uh, says, hey, pastor, even sometimes I feel like, man, that, was, that, went, that went really bad. The delivery was really bad. And someone will say, Man, Pastor, that's exactly what I needed today. What? Well, I know my performance was not great. But the Word of God was what that person needed in that moment. And so the Word of God is glorified. The Word of God is exalted because it's been a help. And here the people are helped. And so we find an exaltation of the Word of God. And lastly, you don't notice verse 49. And the Word of the Lord was published throughout all the region. So here we find a spreading of God's word by the hearers. Do you see the progression here? There was first a spiritual hunger for preaching. Then there was an enthusiasm for others to hear the things that they had heard. Uh, there was an enthusiasm for them to hear the same thing. We find an, an exaltation of the Word of God. And then we find a spreading forth of God's Word by those who had heard. 
It is evident as we look at our text that Paul and Barnabas met on the Sabbath in the synagogue. The people were hearing. And so now the people took the next step after there was this, uh, if you would, this enthusiasm, this hunger, and this exaltation. What is the natural process that happens after something like that? They just said, well, I got to tell somebody. I got to tell somebody. And so they'd go. And notice here, uh, the Bible says here, it was published throughout all the region. So it's not just the city. It went beyond the city. It went to that region. Uh, now, what's the region? Well, if you look at, at a map, right? Uh, it, you know, Antioch of uh, Pisidia is about 1,500 uh, miles northward there of the coast. And so that region would be somewhere in Asia Minor. And so the word of God is spreading. Why? Because the, the hearers, that those who have heard the word of God, says other people need to hear this. Is that how you feel about the Word of God? If we say that we are receivers of the Word, then I think that we need to find those elements in our lives. And if they're not, then perhaps there is something lacking. A spiritual hunger for more preaching, an enthusiasm uh, for others to hear the same, an exaltation of the Word of God, and a spreading of God's Word by the hearers. So do we have a hunger to hear more? Do we want others to hear the same? Are we spreading what we have heard ourselves? But there's a contrast to that, and that is those who rejected the Word of God. Those who rejected the Word of God, notice there are some elements that we find here throughout this account. I want you to notice, first of all, in verse 45, but when the Jews saw the multitudes, they were filled with envy. I want you to notice, first of all, those who rejected, they despised what they saw happening to people. Notice the words. They saw, when they saw the multitude, they were filled with envy. You see, the problem here, if you notice here, when Paul had preached and exhorted the people in the synagogue, the Jews had left. And that's all that had happened. The next Sabbath comes, and now the Jews are seeing that, wow, it looks like the whole city has come together. And when they see the multitude, when they see the hunger, when they see the enthusiasm, when they see the exaltation of the Word of God, when they see the Word of God spreading throughout the whole region, they begin to despise what is happening to people. Have you ever been despised for your zeal for God? You know, often that happens when you first get saved. Because then you go and you try to tell your family members, Hey, I, I got saved and I want you to know how you can be saved. And that's really a natural thing. There's a hunger, there's an enthusiasm, the Word of God is exalted and, and you spread it. That's exactly what happens but here we find here that when that ha happens, often there's a, the opposite to that. Those who are rejected, they often despise what is happening in the lives of people. Yeah. You've lost your mind. What happened to you? I, I remember my uh, father-in-law describes when they, they first got saved, they wanted to tell their family members, and uh, they went to, he went to his in-laws uh, and you know, throughout the process of time, they, they thought, man, they've lost their mind. And so they went to Pastor Moore's wife and kind of secretly said, are you, are you okay? Are you okay? As if there was some brainwashing taking place. As if, you know, uh, someone had lost their mind. They despised what they saw happening to people. You know, isn't it interesting that the world gets upset at the Christian world when they stop being alcoholics and they stop being drug addicts and they stop the things that they used to do before and yet people are still mad? It's strange, isn't it? And so there's something about uh, that, that happens when a spiritual change happens in somebody's life, that there's others that are going to despise what they're going to see happening in your life. Now, let me uh, add this. 
uh, in the realm of the church, uh, sometimes, you know, God works in, in different people's lives in the church. And maybe God has burdened someone to do something, and maybe somebody may have a zeal to serve God. And often, sometimes, it is possible, and I've seen it happen before, although not here, where somebody, a church member, might, might uh, see somebody who is zealous for the Lord and kind of begin to criticize them because they're not as zealous for the Lord. And they see something happening in somebody else's life, and they get upset because something is not happening in their lives. That happens. Oh, just stop being so zealous for the Lord. And sometimes, as in the case of David, somebody's zeal for the Lord is uh, taken as being prideful. That happens. That's a rejecter of God's Word. Those who despise when they see things happening to people spiritually. We also see that they engaged in disputing and vilifying the message and the messenger. Notice verse 45. When they saw the multitude, they were filled with envy and spake against those things which were spoken by Paul. Notice, contradicting and blaspheming. So here the word uh, contradict means to basically to dispute. And so as Paul and Barnabas were preaching, the people were openly contradicting. They were disputing. They were engaged in vain disputation as we often see opposed against, uh, as done against the gospel but also the word blasphemy means to vilify someone and so they were blaspheming they were vilifying both the message and the messenger you say well how, how, how do you think that they did that to the message well by the end of the account they get the city in an uproar to drive them out of the city so at some measure they had to vilify them so you've been changed by the gospel. Now you've become evil. Now you've become bad. Isn't it interesting how the world still does that today? I mean, we live, I think, in the last few weeks in, the, in the, what we've heard on the news. You know, there is an attack on Christians today on the whole subject of abortion. Christians are evil because they want to preserve a baby's life. And they'll say something like, well, don't you have compassion on your neighbor? Don't you have compassion for a woman's right to choose? And they vilify the Christians. You, you see that happening all around us. Those who simply say, look, we believe the Word of God. We believe that, uh, that life is formed from God Himself. And so we stand for the Word of God. It's not about opposing anyone. It's about standing for life and the dignity of life. But people engage in disputing and vilifying both the message and the messengers. And that will often happen when you try to take the gospel to somebody. This is what people do. Say, hey, let me show you. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Are you judging me? Do you think you're better than me? Vilifying. Vilifying. Contradicting and vilifying. That's what they did. So they, they despised what they saw happening to people. They engaged in disputing and vilifying uh, the message and the messenger. We also see in verse, um, a little later, um, Notice verse 45, well actually verse 50, excuse me, verse 50. But the Jews stirred up the devout and honorable women and the chief men of the city and raised persecution against Paul and Barnabas and expelled them out of their coasts. Now I'm going to talk about the honorable women, the chief men of the city and the persecution against Paul next week. But I want to see here that they displayed hostility, they displayed hostility by stirring others against the message and the messengers. You see, what happens is people are not just satisfied with people remaining in the neutral field. You're either a receiver or a rejecter. And if you're a rejecter, what you try to do is you try to, uh, you display hostility, but you do so by doing what? What is the act that they do? They stir up other people. They stir something up in, in other people to join their cause in the opposition uh, in being hostile to both the message and the messenger. 
That's what you see happening today. You see, it's interesting when it comes to the gospel, people are not satisfied with just being neutral. They're not neutral. They have to stir others against both message and messenger. But then if you notice one more thing, the Bible says they expel them out of their coast. So this, this is what we learn here. They deemed the servants of Christ as unworthy of acceptance in society. They deemed the servants of Christ as unworthy of acceptance in society. That's why they expelled them out of their coast. You can't be here. You can't say what you need to say. You're not worthy of being part of society. And if we could, and they did in this case, we would remove you from society. And that's what they did. You know, there are many people who wish they could remove Christians from society. You know, is it interesting that even though we live, I guess you could say, in a uh, democratic republic, so there's a dem democratic process whereby people vote for the representatives, but it's interesting that there's a segment of people who want to stamp out the opposition as if they don't represent anybody. That's just, there's a particular group of people that we want, that, that we deem as unworthy to be part of society. And you see, that's why it's never neutral. Because as soon here as the gospel is being preached, the word of God is being proclaimed, people's lives are being changed, there's an enthusiasm, the word of God is being spread by the hearers, something great is happening. And those who are rejecting the word of God, they can't just sit on the sideline and be silent, they have to do something. They have to silence the word of God. They have to stop the propagation of the word of God. And so they do so by uh, despising the people, by disputing and vilifying the people, by uh, displaying hostility, by stirring up others against the message, and by deeming the servants of Christ to be unworthy uh, as being part of society. We cannot let you function in society. I just spoke with my uh, uh, brother just, uh, I guess, about a month ago, I think it was, and some things are changing in the country of France. Uh, one of those areas is they, just like Germany, they just passed a law where you cannot, you're not allowed to homeschool your children. He said that the state showed up at a Christian camp and told the people that they couldn't force children to read and to memorize scriptures because that was proselytizing. And now they're saying that you have to get a, if you're going to proselytize, evangelize, you need a license from the state. What are they trying to do? Now, in the name of, we don't want to defeat extremism. What are they trying to do? They're trying to stamp Christianity out. That's what they're trying to do. And they're using the law to do it. So, what they're doing is they're trying to communicate to society by passing laws that those who are Christians are unworthy of acceptance in society. And by the way, that's going to increasingly happen as time goes. If you're going to receive the Word of God and have an enthusiasm for God's Word, you're going to find those things happening. They're already happening, but you're going to find them happening in a greater degree. But can I encourage you for just a moment? That sounds depressing, doesn't it? But did you read the last verse? The last two verses? Did you notice? They shook off the dust of their feet against them and came into Iconium. Now, I'll talk a little about, a little about that next week. But notice, and the disciples were filled with what? And with the Holy Ghost. So, it's, it's, in the Bible, there's so many contradictions. It, it appears to be contradictions. Certainly, you, I mean, you can't be despised in a society and disputed and vilified and 
uh, have people hostile against you and be deemed as unworthy to be acceptable in society and still have joy. It just doesn't happen. It does happen. It's always happened. So, is there joy? Or we walk around. Pastor, this, how people are treating us is just, we have a tough life. It's hard and Man, Christian living is just, if we just take a little stand for Christ and just, <clears throat> we just get smacked upside the head. It seems like we just don't make any progress or we don't have any impact. They got kicked out of the city. Now, imagine what it would do to the heart of Paul and Barnabas. People's lives are being changed. There's an enthusiasm, a hunger. And then all of a sudden, that, that, it didn't happen just here. It happened many times for Paul. And they get kicked out. That would have been hard, I think, when you see the moving of God and then you being prevented to continue to do a spiritual work there. And yet, they're kicked out with joy. They didn't leave with joy. They were kicked out with joy. They were counted, as we saw earlier in the book of Acts, worthy to suffer for the name of Christ. You see... Is it that we might think that, well, if we get kicked out or if people respond negatively towards us that uh, maybe it just doesn't work anymore? No, no. The focus here, I believe here, is what added at the end is they were filled with the Holy Ghost. The fruit of being filled with the Holy Ghost is joy. One of the fruit of being filled with the Holy Ghost is joy. Ephesians chapter 4. So joy, joy is not connected to their expelling. Joy is connected to their filling. So if there's not joy, then we have to go back and say, well, have we been endeavoring to do things in our own power, and our own strength? Have we been endeavoring to, to uh, just to try to, I guess, fight uh, the circumstances and to respond? And, and if we, we don't get our way? No, no. Uh, here they obviously, they wanted to stay. Same thing in Thessalonica. They wanted to stay, but they were kicked out. And yet they can leave with joy, you see, because the joy of the Lord is not dependent on our circumstances. It is dependent on our yieldedness to the Spirit of God in our lives. So, Pastor, everything can be going wrong. You still can have joy. Why? Because it's not dependent on you. It's dependent on being yielded to the Holy Ghost. And so they were. You see, here's the question we have to ask ourselves. If there is a lack of joy in our lives, don't look and try to make an excuse because of your circumstances. Look inwardly and see whether you are truly yielded to the Spirit of God. Now that's a challenge. Because we, want to, we don't want to think that the lack of joy is our fault. Can I say with all kindness, it is. It is. Because it's about yieldedness to the Holy Ghost. Pastor, you just don't understand my life. And you don't understand mine either. But you know who does? The Lord does. How about you turn the things that you can't change over to the Lord? Let Him handle that. And then He will give you joy. Because as soon as you release things to Him, peace comes in no matter what happens.